behind me is the confluence of the Susquehanna River with the Chesapeake Bay, which defines the northernmost boundary of a 25,000 acre wetland known as the Susquehanna Flats. Beginning about 1850, market hunters and sportsmen started using thousands of decoys to entice migrating wildfowl within range of their shotguns. Thus, many Harford County carvers were able to supplement their incomes by fashioning and painting what we call today folk art decoys. When market hunting was banned by the federal government in 1918, this business disappeared, and some of these artisans began producing more elaborate decoys, transitioning from folk art to home decorative art. This is that story. There's scant information about how Native Americans used decoys to capture wildfowl. It is known, however, that about 2,300 years ago, Nevada forerunners of the Paiute tribe employed floating duck decoys made of bulrush, cattails, and the tule plant that grew wild in their area. Based on evidence gathered in 1924 from artifacts found in Lovelock Cave, it appears the roosting ducks were likely bow hunted, netted, or snared. This archaeological site is located northeast of Reno, Nevada, in an area known as the Humboldt Sink. Prior to the American Revolution, a decoy in many colonies was known as a wooden stool. This name was derived from the English practice of using a live pigeon tied by one of its legs to a stool, which at that time was any device where a person might sit, such as a stump or section of a log. The bird would flutter, attracting a flock of pigeons into a net for capture. Thus, the tied bird acted as a decoy, and hence in America, the word decoy displaced the older wooden stool terminology. For the Susquehannock Indians in Harford County, the gathering of wild fowl was fairly easy. In 1608, Captain John Smith reported in winter there were great plenty of geese and ducks on which his crew daily feasted. These were killed by gun, but it was also possible to approach wild fowl by canoe and capture them by net, by snare, or by hand. Because of the tremendous multitudes of wild fowl, the Harford County decoy would come into prominence much later. Each year, as the northern climates began to freeze and limit the supply of food for ducks and geese, the birds began a southern migration down what is called the Atlantic Flyway. Many passed through the Chesapeake Bay area, feasting on the aquatic grasses along the coastline and the remnants of corn left behind from harvested farm fields. A favorite wildfowl destination was a 25,000 acre area known as the Susquehanna Flats. It encompassed a number of shallow water shoals that were created by alluvial soil being washed down the Susquehanna River over its 444 mile trip to the bay. This nutrient rich earth supported a variety of grasses, including pond weeds, red reed grasses, and a canvas back duck feeding favorite variety called wild celery. The earliest known reference to duck hunting in the Susquehanna Flats was documented by George Johnston in his Cecil County book when he reported on March 11, 1786, that Thomas Winans bought a part of Carpenter's Point described as famous for its ducking shore. About three decades later, the earliest known duck hunting club in Harford County was established on Gunpowder Neck near Maxwell's Point, but no mention was made of the use of decoys at that time. Joel Barber reported in his Wild Fowl book that in 1830, decoys were then little known in the Chesapeake Bay area, and that one bay hunting technique revolved around concealing a gunner and his dog inside a large flat-sided tobacco barrel known as a hogshead that had been sunk in the mud along a shoreline. By 1849, however, decoys had definitely been introduced as a Maryland law was passed prohibiting the use of decoy ducks on the Chester and Sassafras rivers in Kent County. On October 2, 1852, the Heaven Grace correspondent for the Cecil Whig newspaper provided a description of commercial or market gunning. Paraphrasing his account, he wrote, 
Those of our citizens who make a business of gunning during the ducking season are making extensive preparations for the advent of the feathered tribe. It has been quite a source of profit to our town, there being several thousand dollars invested in outfits such as boats and decoys. They generally shoot from a boat which is called a coffin, a box sufficiently large for a man to lie down at full length with large wings on each side to keep it afloat. It is then sunk by weights level with the water and placed at a suitable distance from the decoys. As soon as the ducks make a dart at the decoys, the person in the box raises up and lets loose his artillery on them, generally doing good execution. To give your readers an idea of the ammunition used during the gunning season, I will give you a statement given me by one of the gunners. The season generally begins about the 1st of October and ends in March. During this time, they consume some 2,250 pounds of powder, 11,250 pounds of shot, and some 6,000 decoy ducks. It is generally thought that ducks will be abundant this year, their principal feeding grounds, the flats, being covered with grass. Once they get a taste of the grass, it's a difficult matter to drive them away. The use of some 6,000 decoys in 1852 meant many of the shooters also made their own working decoys that included carving and painting during the off-season. This is substantiated by an article in the Harford Democrat on September 26, 1879, that reported, Our duck shooters are busy painting decoys. It is probable that some of the paint was applied to new decoys, and also some of the brush strokes to touch up the older ones. One of the ducks that appeared in great numbers was the canvasback that was prized for its delicacy and richness of flesh. It soon became a favorite seasonal menu item in upscale city restaurants located in New York City, Philadelphia, Richmond, and Baltimore. As the demand was high, so were the prices it brought, as gunners sought ways to harvest as many canvasback ducks as possible. Thus, as historian Joel Barber rightfully concluded, the market gunner, more than any other, is the father of decoys. Making a decoy in the 1850s was a labor-intensive process. It started with cutting out a block of wood slightly larger than the desired decoy and allowing it to season for many months, thereby ensuring the decoy would not later develop cracks. A pattern of the bird would be sketched on the top and a profile pattern on the side. A buck saw might be used to remove some of the excess material or the maker might chop it away with a hatchet. Holding the block with a vise, a draw knife was used to carve it roughly in the desired shape, followed by a more delicate spoke shave, making the final trims. To remove the resulting ridges, the decoy maker used sandpaper that was often held in place with a wooden block. Next, the decoy head was cut out with the buck saw and then whittled, using carving knives to achieve the desired shape. The final step was sanding it smooth. It was then applied with a nail or a wooden dowel to the body that was first sealed with paint and allowed to dry. Thereafter, it was artistically painted to emulate the intended bird species. A metal weight was secured to the bottom to provide ballast, and a leather strap was installed to which the line with an anchor was later secured. There were several ways the wooden decoy was used to attract live ducks. A hunter would use a tall blind constructed with local grasses, often on a point of land jutting into the water. He would set a number of decoys adjacent to the blind and then crouch down in the reeds to avoid being seen. When the unsuspecting and oncoming wildfowl flew over to check out the site, the hunter would fire his shotgun. In some cases, a blind was constructed on a boat, allowing hunters to venture out into open waters. Ducks bagged this way were often brought to the shore or to the hunter's boat by his dog, a trusted Chesapeake Bay retriever. The most elaborate market hunting device was the sink box, also known as a surface boat, and sometimes called a battery. It was basically a flat, rectangular boat that supported a well, which allowed a man with his gun and ammunition to be fairly well concealed. Around the four sides of the boat were hinged wings, 
allowing for a smaller footprint when being towed by a sailboat to its location on the water. Once in position and unfolded, painted flat-bottomed iron decoys were placed on the body of the boat, causing it to sink approximate to the level of the water, and wooden flat-bottomed decoys were placed around the unfolded canvas wings. To further entice a flock of wildfowl, another 200 to 500 floating decoys were distributed around the surface boat. For more firepower, some of these crafts were constructed with two wells, allowing for a pair of gunners. The bushwhack boat was a less elaborate craft, painted white, that typically deployed about 150 decoys. A sculler with a paddle in the rear would move the boat away from the stools or decoys and await flying ducks to alight and join the decoy flock. Once this happened, the bushwhack, or so-called sneak boat, would be slowly edged towards the ducks, and when in range, a gunner in the bow, often hidden by a one-foot-high canvas curtain, would take aim with his shotgun. Hunting at night by using a large reflector behind a naphtha flare lamp on the bow of a boat was generally frowned upon by many for its unsportsmanlike technique. A flock of sleeping wildfowl would be encountered, causing the confused ducks to approach the rig that often was equipped with a so-called large caliber punt gun capable of killing 80 to 100 ducks with a single shot. This disfavored practice was first prohibited in Harford County in 1832 on the waters of Swan Creek, Spasusha Narrows, Romney Creek, Bush River, and the Gunpowder River. C. John Sullivan, in his book Waterfowling on the Chesapeake, relates the story of how the Chesapeake Bay Retriever derived from two Newfoundland pups that were rescued from a sinking English brig bound to Poole, England in 1807. The male and female pups, along with the crew, were taken aboard the ship Canton and delivered to Norfolk, Virginia. The pups were respectively named Sailor and Canton, with the male ending up in Maryland, promulgating the Sailor breed as it was known on the western shore, thus evolving into the Chesapeake Bay Retriever. The early carvers produced what is known today as folk art that was influenced by the values held in their culture. For the watermen in Harford County along the Chesapeake Bay and its inlets, the folk art was not a one-dimensional walking stick nor a two-dimensional sampler, but a carved and painted three-dimensional representation of a wildfowl. Carver Harry Robert Jobes Jr. probably put it best a few years ago, noting, Folk art is a result of ordinary people expressing themselves through their creation and construction of utilitarian objects that convey meaning and value to themselves or others within their culture. Each individual is an artist who wants to be recognized for his or her own work and while always learning from others, inevitably wants to strike out on their own. Some of the carvers born prior to 1900 and representations of their work were Charles Nelson Barnard, who had several jobs during his career that included working on the railroad and being the captain of his sailing scrow, the Ella Barnard. He's best known, however, for his high head canvas backs, but he also produced canvas back ducks with more conventional neck lengths. Samuel Treadway Barnes was a carpenter, fisherman, hunter, gunning guide, and decoy maker. Like many other Heaven Grace carvers, he produced canvas backs and also made some redhead decoys. James Alexander Jim Courier was a Havita Grace postmaster who also functioned as a gunning guide and carver. He produced high head canvas back decoys as well as high head mallards. There was the Holly family, John Sr. or Daddy, sons William, James, and John Jr. John W. Daddy Holly was a boat builder and fisherman who owned the boat William W. Hopkins and the sloop Jumbo. He also made decoys such as canvas bags prior to 1850. William Watson Holly was one of Daddy's sons who became a wood grainer and carver, also producing canvas back decoys. Another son, James T. Holly, was a boat builder and carver who is known to have produced hollow mallards. Robert Franklin Bob McGaw III had several jobs, including insurance collector, mail carrier, and part-time duck hunter, but is best remembered as a carver. 
In addition to canvas backs, he carved and painted bluebill decoys as well as pintail decoys. Charles Taylor Wilson was a boat captain, school teacher, and Havre de Grace mayor, who also found time to carve decoys. One of his efforts was the blue-winged teal. While not delineated, nearly every early carver made canvas back decoys because of the duck's prominence on the Susquehanna Flats. It is interesting that Harper's Weekly in 1889 provided a description of how the canvas back duck received its name. The magazine reported that the white feathers crossed with wavy lines and dots of black suggest the coarse thread found in a piece of canvas cloth. Perhaps somewhat ironically, a kind of canvas is also called duck, but this name derives from a Teutonic root meaning cloth. Adding to this confusion is a company marketing a type of heating and ventilation sealing product called duct tape. The Havre de Grace Republican of March 21, 1879 reported that the fall of 1878 ducking season had opened under very favorable auspices as the day was clear and cold with just enough wind to make shooting good. One sink box shooter killed 344. All of them did well. Some of the bushwhackers got up to 50. Selling prices were for canvas backs $1.50, redheads $1.00, and blackheads 40 cents, with an upward tendency. Before the gunning season had closed in March of the following year, R.T. Clayton, operator of the United States Hotel, was making excursions in his steamer Viola to the ducking grounds on the Susquehanna Flats, with a party of New York gentlemen, among whom were Mr. Cheever, a merchant, and H. Munn Esquire of the Scientific American magazine. The editor of the Havre de Grace Republican had to poke a little fun, noting, we understand the party had a good time and had reasonable luck in killing the much prized canvas bag, which, although they were amateurs in the business, was done, no doubt, scientifically. In 1880, the first mechanical refrigerated railroad car patent was issued and resulted in transporting perishable goods over longer distances. This allowed harvested ducks to reach more remote markets, thus increasing their demand. The canvas backs taken from the Susquehanna Flats were an epicure's favorite for their taste, partially as a result of a diet on wild celery grass that grew there. The canvas back only ate a small portion of the grass by diving into the water to the bottom of the flat, uprooting the stalk, thus allowing it to float upward. At this point, the duck resurfaced, nibbled off the root, and repeated the cycle until satiated. This vegetable diet, when contrasted with eating worms and grubs, was a factor in producing the canvas back's fine-tasting flesh. Such a harvesting process, however, was not without its perils. The smaller widgeon duck was not able to uproot the celery grass, so it would linger nearby, gobbling off the root of the stalk before the canvas back reappeared. With declining wildfowl populations and variations in state regulation, in 1918, Congress passed the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that stringently limited the hunting or killing of migratory birds. The purchase or sale of wildfowl was prohibited, ending the careers of market gunners, and regulations were placed on personal sport hunting. Birds could be taken by shotguns no larger than 10 gauge from blinds or floating devices using decoys. Thus, the sink box and sneak boat survived. The General Assembly of Maryland was allowed to enact legislation to further promote wildfowl conservation and in 1918 created the state hunting license. According to his own words, Madison Mitchell said he just wanted to be a good funeral director. But it's also known when deaths took a downturn, he turned to carving wooden decoys. Born near Havre de Grace in 1901, he was given the name Robert Madison Mitchell. However, while growing up, he developed a fondness for his uncle, E. Madison Mitchell, who was an undertaker in Baltimore. This relationship prompted him to style his name as R. Madison Mitchell. In 1918, he moved to Baltimore and lived in an apartment over his uncle's funeral home and attended Baltimore Business College. 
In 1920, he returned to have it a grace, and shortly after receiving his embalmer's license in 1922, he opened a funeral home on Washington Street. Interestingly, decoy carver Samuel Treadway Barnes, who was a contemporary of his father, helped paint his new business facility. During the slow times of funeral directing, Mitchell helped Barnes with his decoy work, which was done completely by hand using a saw, hatchet, draw knife, and spoke shave. Barnes was a workaholic, seemingly at the task all the time, a characteristic that no doubt influenced Mitchell in his work habits. In 1926, Barnes died of pneumonia, leaving behind decoy back orders of about 1,400 birds that Mitchell was totally unprepared to fill. Sensing an opportunity, he established his own shop behind his funeral business and equipped it with power tools such as a decoy body turning lathe, a belt sander built by a local machinist, and a bandsaw. These tools facilitated the production of decoy bodies, but learning how to decorate the carvings loomed as a challenge. Mitchell sought guidance from Captain Bill Moore, who taught him the skills of mixing, blending, and applying paint that allowed Mitchell to fill the orders before the next gunning season. Over time, the decoy body patterns of Barnes were modified to round off sharp lines that better accommodated the lathe-turned products. He used lead rather than iron for ballast and substituted a stapled iron ring replacing the leather strap to which the decoy line and anchor were tied. Having learned only to paint three styles, his production was limited to canvasbacks, redheads, and blackheads, also called bluebills. Business was good, so in 1932 he rebuilt and enlarged his shop. As a conservation move in 1934, the state of Maryland outlawed the use of sink boxes for wildfowl hunting thereby eliminating the need for hundreds of decoys. This law significantly depressed the decoy carving market, but some of the slack was taken up by individual sport hunters who preferred decoys of a better quality than those employed with a sink box. Mitchell began to closely examine live ducks, modifying his patterns to more accurately reflect their bodies and their heads. He even productionized decoy painting with five individuals sitting around a table passing the bird to the next painter as each applied a color to their part of the decoy. When working in the shop, Mitchell was constantly ready to answer the telephone and respond to his funeral business. He often wore khaki pants with a shirt and a bow tie, as a long tie would have presented hazards of getting caught in the machinery. As a result of his improved patterns, attention to detail, and high-quality standards, Mitchell gained a reputation for producing a superbly crafted and functional decoy. Some buyers acquired his birds not for gunning purposes, but as art objects to be used as household decorations. This was partially stimulated by his so-called Christmas ducks, where, for holiday gifts, extra attention was given to the carving details and to the painting. R. Madison Mitchell is universally recognized as the dominant dean of decoys, whose patterns and technique influenced the work of many artisans who followed generations later. In 1934, Joel Barber published his seminal yet somewhat romantic book, Wild Fowl Decoys, becoming the first collector of this folk art form, calling them floating sculptures. He recognized decoys as the only waterborne forms of carving which were made for strictly utilitarian purposes and not for show or decoration. In a 1954 reprint, an introduction by George Ross Starr pointed out that Joel Barber was the man who made the old decoys live again. Many of these objects were simplistic, rustic, and rough, but they were part of American folk art that, once unmasked, could never be duplicated. Charles E. Shang Wheeler was born in Saugatuck, Connecticut in 1872 and became an amateur boxer, oyster expert and farmer, state senator, author, and artist, but is best remembered for his lifelike decoy carvings that, when placed next to the real birds, experts were hard-pressed to tell the difference. He was a large man, standing six feet tall, and weighing some 260 pounds, but had a fine artistic touch. 
Sometime after his death in 1949, the New York Times described him as the man who made decoys an art form. Some of his outstanding work that supports this title are a wood duck drake, shoveler hen, Canada goose, pintail hen, and ruddy duck drake. A simple device for plastic injection molding had been invented as early as 1872, but it was not until 1946 when James Watson Hendry built the world's first extrusion screw injection machine that the process became practical. Thereafter, it was possible to make an aluminum mold of a duck and have it easily produced by the thousands. After painting, the decoy was truly lifelike and sold at a fraction of the cost of a wooden equivalent. This technological improvement irked Madison Mitchell, who described the innovations as plastic junk. But for practical purposes, it signaled the end to wooden decoy production for duck hunting. The decoy maker would, however, survive, concentrating on more artfully carved birds. In 1963, Harold D. Sorensen of Burlington, Iowa, began publishing a magazine called The Decoy Collector's Guide. The publication resonated with interested individuals across the United States who considered decoys worth collecting and also using them as art in home decoration. Two years later, Adele Ernest published The Art of the Decoy, American Bird Carvings. In a foreword written by the director of the Museum of Early American Folk Art, it was stated, most important perhaps, Mrs. Ernest's book establishes the decoy as a fascinating, unique, and indigenous American folk art. So this was the assessment of early decoys. But now, birds were being produced with elaborate graining of feathers and being painted with the eye of a fine artist, thereby finding a niche as an art object in homes. Madison Mitchell had referred to such decoys as Christmas ducks, while celebrated carver Len Ward on the Eastern Shore called them fancy ducks. Regardless of the name, the decoy had evolved from folk art to decorative art. Some creative carvers who were eager to move artistic goalposts decided to incorporate an environmental context in which one or more wildfowl was presented. This might be a waterfront marsh scene where a bird is perched on a piece of driftwood. Such displays tended to be large when compared with a single duck. Therefore, this art is generally relegated to a museum exhibit. Thus, the decorative decoy had evolved into the new medium of display art. Beginning about 1850, the use of wooden decoys first appeared in Harford County, primarily concentrated on the Susquehanna Flats. For the most part, these lures were made by local individuals who earned a portion of their living from what was called market gunning. In the follow-on century, starting about 1925, R. Madison Mitchell operated a decoy shop on Washington Street behind his funeral home. And by employing modern tools and production line techniques, he fashioned what is estimated to be a whopping 100,000 decoys. Through Mitchell's meticulous work and his driving vision beginning in the 1970s, the Habit of Grace Decoy Museum was established in 1986. Therefore, this Harford County waterfront community at the confluence of the Susquehanna River and Chesapeake Bay can rightfully claim to be the decoy capital of the world. We have learned that decorative decoy art is still progressing with some very talented individuals now creating wildlife carvings set in an environmental context. This is a medium that is becoming recognized as display art. Creative expression continues to evolve and we eagerly await for current and future generations of Harvey Canyons to take our decoy carving heritage to the next artistic level.